and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a second round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. Like what you hear? Click the thumbs up. Don't care for it? Click the thumbs down. Good luck to all of our contestants. She Didn't Get Away Written by Matt Demersky Performed by Orko Chakraborty for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and the Evil Idol Competition. I can tell you now with miserable certainty that it is better to live in ignorant mediocrity. Like every burgeoning young man my age, I recently began questioning the foundations of my habits and beliefs, structures built haphazardly by muddling through adolescence without any real aspirations or guidance. It was time to clean up my act, time to get serious, time to man up. And that meant finally getting free of my medications. I couldn't remember a time before my numerous daily pills. I'd simply always taken them. And they kept my early memories hazy and unreliable. I had a vague notion of various conditions that the pills were meant to control. But as I became more of what I felt was an adult, I began feeling that I could manage without them. I'd already told my doctor this on several occasions throughout the last year, but each time he told me that we should wait and see. Last week, I confronted him as much as I dared, asking if it was safe to begin dropping my doses, because I was going to do it with or without his permission. I'd been going to him for checkups my entire life. But I don't think I've seen him react quite so... oddly. He stepped back and seemed to be considering something with a deep frown. It took him a full minute to respond, but when he finally did, it was only to tell me that we should still wait and see. I asked him what exactly we were waiting for. He hesitated again only to subsequently tell me that doctor-patient confidentiality prevented him from discussing it. Confused, I asked him to elaborate, but he refused. I asked him what exactly my medications were for. For once, he didn't give me a spiel about anxiety or ADHD or depression or any of the other litany of diagnoses I cycled through as I'd grown. He simply told me to ask my grandfather. With a sense of unease gnawing at my gut, I left and contacted him. This attempt at self-determination had all been born of regret at a foggy, lazy, and wasted youth, and I blame much of that on my dad. He had tried valiantly to raise me right but his job had kept him gone at all hours for most of each week, so I'd been mostly left to my own devices. Aside from various neighborhood misadventures with the wrong crowd, I'd spent much of my time next door at my grandfather's house. He was a jolly, kind-hearted man, with a subtle heaviness behind his eyes that I'd always suspected came from the effort of taking care of my grandmother. Contacting him for a conversation like this could only mean I was about to learn some unhappy family history. She sat on the porch as I arrived under the glow of early evening. She subtly engaged her rocking chair as I approached, the only indication she ever gave that she was aware of me. She just stared ahead absently as I kissed her on the forehead, said hello, and then proceeded inside the aging house they had lived in for as long as my murky memories could recall. My grandfather sat on a stool in the kitchen, that unspoken burden plainly visible on his face. I knew immediately that my fears had been right, 
I sat on the stool opposite. He sighed. Ah, I've been dreading this conversation, but there's no avoiding it. Has your father ever mentioned how your mother died? No, I replied, a heavy weight settling in around my chest. Well, how to put this? He turned his head to watch my grandmother through the window for a long moment. Before this house, we lived on a farm. I'd inherited it from my father, who had helped his father build the whole thing back when land was cheap and towns were few and far between. I nodded. I'd heard the mention of the farm once or twice in whispered conversation between relatives. Did everyone in the family know except me? My grandfather looked down at his hands as he continued, his voice low. I didn't understand what it was the first few times it came around. I sat up straight. It? He curled his wrinkled, work-worn fingers into fists. I should have shot it that first night. I had the family hunting rifle, and it seemed disoriented. One shot straight to the... He held up his right hand about eight inches from his head and moved it back and forth, indicating some unknown oversized curvature. One shot and your mother might have... He shook his head. No, no, I can't get sucked into regret again. He finally stopped staring angrily at his hands, instead looking me in the eye. Regret is luxury. You just have to deal and get by. That's what this family has always done. I was receptive to this message in a vague sense. But my horrified fascination remained solely on the past trauma to my family that I had always suspected. What was it? I racked my brain for years trying to make sense of it. Of him, he responded. It was a man. It was definitely a man, if not in the sense that you and I know. I understood from his tone that he meant it was aware that it was not simply some horrible animal. It looked me straight in the eye that first night, he whispered. Right at me, acknowledging me, sizing me up. It had this too horrific, beady... He paused, set his jaw for a moment, then switched tack. All I really took away from that encounter were the arms. The arms? I asked, eyes wide. The one thought I remember most clearly. That's a spider leg. Jointed, eerily smooth segments glimmering under my light. But it wasn't spider leg. It was an arm. It lifted that arm against the sudden light and backed away. That arm had fingers. Five fingers so... Human, but not, with little pointed blades on the end of each. I had a sudden sense of disassociation as I pulled away from the description in disgust and revulsion for a moment. Part of me wanted to laugh away this impossible thing in the woods near the family farm, but my grandfather seemed deadly serious. I froze, and it ran, he continued. But it came back, every few nights, testing the edges of the farm, watching us from between the trees at night. Did you get help? I asked, feeling his helpless fear as it was still ongoing. Uh, yes, once we found the first kill, one of our cows, left hanging from a tree by thick, sticky threads. His inner organs dissolved and... Sucked out somehow. That was enough evidence. And our neighbors had seen it too. We got the boys, and we went hunting. I gripped the table, unhappily already aware of how the story was going to end. Did you find it? Ah, yes. He said with a sigh, and I saw that weight on his soul more clearly than ever. 
but only near dawn on the way back home. It was trying to leave our farm. We shot it a dozen times each, then took a sledgehammer to it when it wouldn't stop screeching. And then we burned that godforsaken corpse for good measure. But we were too late. It had already been to the house. He nodded sadly. In the end, I think that she was what it really wanted. Finally putting the pieces of my mother's dead together, I could only feel a sense of empty resolution. From all the whispered conversations and sad faces I'd seen, that horrible fate was the only one that made sense. Was that why I wasn't meds that made me forget? Had I been there as a baby? Had I seen it? I did have the strangest sense that I knew what he was talking about. Strangely clear image in my head of a creature only he barely described. My life was finally starting to make sense. I turned and looked through the window at my grandma. She must have seen it too. Must have seen it murder my mother and do to her what it did to that cow. And that's why she had turned inward. Why she'd been mentally absent my entire life. Thinking of the logistics of the horrific attack, I realized my grandmother must have grabbed me and rescued me. How did she get away? I asked, heart pounding. My grandfather blinked. Uh, I'm sorry? He narrowed his eyes unhappily. I don't think you quite understand. Your grandmother didn't get away. I turned away from watching her to look back at him in confusion. Then how did she survive? How did I survive? If it killed my mother, he grabbed my wrist, his tone deadly insistent. Your grandmother didn't escape, but it wasn't there to kill her. What are you saying? I asked, trying to pull away from his painful grip. You weren't there. Your mother wasn't there. This was many more years ago than you're thinking. The vile thing wasn't there to kill your grandmother. It... He paused, finding a body-shaking tremble to continue. It had horrific, beady, yellow eyes. I pulled away harder, but he wouldn't let me go. No! Yes! He shouted. And that's why you have to take your goddamn pills. Your mother didn't have the luxury of modern medicine, and when she was a little older than you... <sighs> he seemed to take in a painful breath and let me go. A sense of despairing calm settled over me. I understood in that moment. I had more questions, but they could wait. With a grim nod, I departed my grandfather's aging house and left my grandmother with a parting kiss on the forehead and a whispered apology. I walked calmly to my house, went inside, entered the bathroom, locked the door, and proceeded to take all my needed pills. The experience of taking so many pills, recently increasingly tiresome, now felt religiously important. Here, then, was salvation. This I accepted, as I stared blankly in the mirror, not quite sure how to feel, not sure how to process a detail once benign, once interesting. Now, innately revolting and terrifying, my left eye, my off-color iris, my one yellow eye because she didn't get away thanks for listening if you haven't already don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via a thumbs up or thumbs down vote by doing so you'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team
At the close of voting on August 15th, based on your votes, the top 25 contestants will advance to the third round, which begins September 1st, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 